بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمني بنور الفهم اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزائن علومك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين إن شاء الله Today we will discuss uh, the importance of teaching and the blessings that people who teach receive in this world and the hereafter. And then uh, next week we have a very important discussion about what should we try to achieve when it comes to Islamic education if our students our pupils achieve them we can say we have been successful if they don't achieve them and the, because of shortcoming on our side then it means that we have failed so inshallah that is very important discussion for next week but today we want to talk about teaching and benefits and blessings of teaching rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam said yaji ur rajul yawm al qiyamah wa lahu min al hasanat ka sahab ar rukam awal jibal ar rawasi there are two versions on the day of judgment a person comes and would have hasanat like either mountains or like very thick and huge clouds there are two versions one says as sahab ar or al jabal ar rawasi so much hasanat in his account or her account فَيَغُولُ يَا رَبِّهِ أَنَّا لِهَذَا وَلَمْ أَعْمَلْهَا He is honest. <laughs> he, he would not say, okay, maybe there is a mistake, but we shouldn't say anything and you know, just keep it for ourselves. No, he is honest. He says, oh Allah, how can this be for me? I have not done these things. Then he would be answered, "Hada ilmu kaladi alam tahun nas, yu'malu bihi min ba'dik." This is your knowledge that you taught people, and after you, people acted upon it. People practiced. Their practice will be added to your practice without them losing anything. So anything will be registered in their name but also similar or maybe more to your name. So this is why it's so massive. And this is why you see things that you have not done. Imam Baqir alayhi salam says, Man allama baba hudan falahu mithlu ajr man amila bih wala yunqasu ulaika min ujurihim shay'a. Uh, maybe we, I can share my screen. So yes, Shirna, you can share it. So they can see the hadith, inshallah. So now, no, no. Uh, can you see the hadith, Imam Bagh al Salam? Not yet. So maybe try again.
Or if you want, you can send me the file and I can share it. Or okay. the link. Yeah, I think... Uh, Okay. Because maybe it helps with your concentration if you can see. Okay, we leave it for inshallah next week because then I have to go to email and email you. So, Imam Baqir al salam says, Man allama baba hudan fallahu mithlu ajr man amila bih. Whoever teaches a gate of guidance, Basically, you open for them a new horizon, a new chapter in their life for goodness, for barakah, for light, for guidance, basically. فَلَّهُ مِثْلُ عَجْرِ مَنْ عَمِلَ بِهِ This teacher will get the reward of whoever acts upon this. But without them losing anything from their reward. This is the beauty of working for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are not losing if you do infal, you are not losing if you pray for others, you are not losing if you are teaching to, you know, others. They benefit, you benefit. If you are not selfish, everyone can benefit. Abu Basir, who was a companion of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, had a conversation with Imam alayhi salam. Imam alayhi salam told him, Man allama khayran fallahu ajrun, ajrun mithlu man amila bih. The same thing that Imam Bagar said. Whoever teaches something good, get the reward of any person who acts upon it. Abu Basir says, "Qultu fa in allamahu ghayrahu yajri zalika." What if this person, who is the student of the first one, teaches a second person? So is it the first group of students, the first generation of students that if they do something, the teacher gets benefit or if the students also teach other students? Is this going to continue? Imam alayhi salam said, in allama nasa kullahum jara lahu. Imam said yes, even if this continues and would reach all people and all people directly or indirectly benefit from this person's knowledge, he will get the reward. If he dies, it still continues or this is as long as he's alive and his students are teaching and you know benefiting. Imam said, wa in mata. Even if he dies. So our teachers, teachers of our teachers, teachers of teachers of our teachers, whatever good we do, they benefit. 
and they would be happy and perhaps they pray for us we are not losing anything but indeed we are multiplying our action because all those people also benefit it's a great investment and in turn you teach people you get benefit but also you add again to their benefits Amir al-Mu'mini alayhi salam about the benefit of teaching and how it adds to knowledge he says inna nar la yamqusha ma akhadha minha walakin yukhmiduha alla tajita hataba fire does not lessen when another fire brand is lit from it you take a for example i don't know wood on a fire and this wood is lit and you take the fire away it's not harming the fire but if you don't add the wood to fire then little by little it's going to stop finish Amir al mumin says, وَكَذَلِكَ الْعِلْمِ Knowledge is the same. لَا يُفْنِيهِ الْإِقْتِبَاسِ If you teach and many many people learn from you, your knowledge is not reduced. It's not that you are giving away. When you teach, you are not giving away because you are keeping it. You are just sharing. It's like, for example, I have a light in front of me. I am studying. You say, can I also use your light you know, to study? I say, yes, please. If you sit and use this light, it's not going to reduce my light. Knowledge is a light that teacher has and shares with other people. But it's not going to have less. So, العلم لا يفنيه الاقتباس لكن بخل الحاملين له سبب عدمه But if the carriers of knowledge are miserly, if they are not generous with their knowledge, if they don't teach, they don't share, then this leads to disappearance of knowledge. Not teaching, not sharing keeping it to yourself that's the problem so here it says sharing is not reducing then in some hadith we say actually sharing makes it better Amir al-Mumin alayhi salam says a'avannu al-ashya ala tazkiyat al-aql at-ta'alim beautiful hadith A'avan, from own, own means help, assistance. The most helpful thing for polishing and purifying your aql is teaching. You understand better when you teach. Of course, as we said before, you should be able to do justice to the subject. It's not that I don't know the subject and I just through teaching want to learn. You have to know the subject. When you go to the class, you should be able to do justice. So, if you don't know enough, learn before the class. And if it's not your field, leave it till you qualify yourself. But someone who is able to do justice by teaching becomes better and better. His mind becomes sharper, the knowledge becomes more polished. Even Amir al-Mumin says, Tazkiyatul Aql, purification. Because, you know, there are many things that you think you know, but you don't know. When you are teaching, you have to review, people ask questions, then there's the chance for you to understand your weakness, to understand where you didn't really know. You think, you know, you know, but you didn't know.
امام حسن علیه السلام سید علم الناس و تعلم علم غیرک Teach people and learn knowledge of others. In Islam, teacher always is learner. Teacher is always interested in taking lessons, in asking questions, in reading new things. In Hose, we have some beautiful practices. that I hope inshallah these just remain and grow uh, I hope our hosas don't lose these things one of these great practices is Mubahatha that students who take the same lesson normally they take the same lesson sometimes a person who has studied before does Mubahatha with the people who are just taking lessons but most of time people who get the same lesson after they have taken the lesson they go and study they prepare themselves and they become so familiar with the subject that they can try to teach they are not yet teacher necessarily but they try to be able to teach and to relay what the teacher said so they go They are all prepared then randomly they ch choose one person everyone has to be prepared they choose one person and starts teaching like the teacher and the others ask questions maybe they challenge him if he's not uh, speaking well and in this process they all understand better their ability to digest to grasp to memorize and even their ability to deliver all would increase this is one important practice in Islamic education that we have in hosas but it's something that all islamic education should be about number two our experience of teaching and our experience of learning don't have big gap because you know in hosa learning is a long process sometimes you know when i'm talking about hosa to non-muslims you know visitors who come to home or you know we met we meet them outside i say for us we have long process and seven eight years for us is just to warm up if someone in home has studied seven eight years is not considered as a even junior scholar it's just a talab at least if you want to be considered as a scholar think about 14-15 years if you want to become a mujtahid nowadays 15-20 years so it's a long process because we want to make sure that we grasp it's not just we are in hurry to get a certificate and go no we want to grasp things so because there is such a long process of learning There is no then point in waiting till you graduate and start teaching. You are not going to graduate <laughs> in a sense uh, till you are alive because you want to keep it continuing. And even if you, for example, say, okay, uh, for example, finish the muqaddamat, finish so too. Our tradition says no. You don't need to wait. as soon as you learn something if there is a person who asks you to teach you can teach him it's up to him if he, if he thinks that you are qualified you think you are qualified yes if he wants to go to someone higher than you he is more than welcome because in hose again another beautiful tradition in the hose was was that A students choose their teachers sometimes students prefer to go to very senior ulama sometimes they prefer to go to uh, scholars who are younger 
and they are not that much famous they have not that many students because they can uh, spend more time with the teacher teacher has more time to spend with them there are different reasons people have different you know taste sometimes people want someone who is faster someone you know prefer someone who takes you know time so this is also another beautiful thing that you choose your teacher so as soon as we learn something we can uh, start teaching I remember when I had not yet gone to Rome uh, still I was in uh, high school and I was going to a sheikh in Tehran rahmatullah alayh, to take some lessons on Arabic three days a week we used to go after high school to take lessons on Arabic and uh, still I didn't have the idea of going to Rome I was just interested in learning Arabic to help me as a person with reading Quran and Hadith etc. But after some time when a new person was coming, he was asking us also to teach them. So we started little by little there. And when I went to Qom, maybe towards the end of the first year or at least I'm sure from the second year, I was also myself teaching. Sometime maybe one person. Then after four years I started teaching in the uh, schools in classes with 20 30 people so this is the beauty of learning and teaching together so you understand your teachers better you understand your students better and you are always fresh you try to learn so Imam Hassan alayhi salam says Allem nas Teach people and learn knowledge of others. And if someone has knowledge and people are in need and hides the knowledge, keeps the knowledge for himself or herself, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Katimul ilm yal'anuhu kullu shay' hatta al-hut fi al-bahr wa at-tayr fi as-sama The one who hides knowledge and doesn't share knowledge everything would curse him or her even animals even fish in ocean and a bird in the sky you remember we said even fish in the ocean would ask forgiveness from Allah on behalf of seeker of knowledge talibul ilm because this world as I say many times is a school the whole world is made for us as a school to learn, to practice, to improve. So if you are learning and teaching and practicing, everything says, well done. We try to serve you. But if you don't learn, you don't share, everything becomes unhappy with you. And say, you have come to a school but you are not benefiting from the school and you are wasting your time and wasting others time so katimul ilm yal'anuhu kull shay hatta al hut fi al bahr wa at tayr fi as sama there is another hadith that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a hadith Qudsi, in a divine saying, said to Musa alayhi salam, this is not Torah, this is hadith Qudsi, because Allah sometimes uh, had conversation with his prophets and messengers, which were not part of the book. So Allah said to Musa, Ya Musa, ta'allam al khair wa allimhu nas. 
فَإِنِّي مُنَوِّرٌ لِمُعَلِّمِ الْخَيْرِ وَمُتَعَلِّمِهِ قُبُورَهُمْ O Musa, learn khair, what is good, and teach khair to people. Because I am enlightening the grave of teachers and learners of the good. Hatta la yastaw hashu b'makanim, so that they would not feel lonely in their graves. So in dunya has baraka, in barzakh has baraka, in qiyama has baraka, in heaven has baraka. You always get benefit from learning and teaching. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إن الله وملائكته حتى النملة في جحرها وحتى الهوت في البحر لا يصلون على معلم الناس الخير. We say إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي. Okay. So on a lower degree level, إن الله وملائكته Allah and his angels and even ants and fish they send salutations to someone who is teaching people al khair the good of course as you know salutation for Allah is direct because Allah can send salutations for angels and others is to ask Allah to send salutation. Like when we say, Allahumma salla ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad, we say, sallaytu ala Rasulullah. But what did I do? I didn't really send salutation to the Prophet. Although I say, you know, I sent salutation. But for me, salutation is to ask Allah to send salutation. So, Allah and the angels and living beings, they would send salutations to the people who teach others the good. So, Alhamdulillah, you have tawfiq or inshallah soon you will have tawfiq of being teacher. This is a great blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your category is so much high if you are a teacher and shall I be grateful and do justice to it I escape some some of the uh, escape uh, some of the hadith then we go to an issue that I think is uh, important about charging when you teach can you charge people some fees when you teach Islamic, aqaid, akhlaq, fiqh, or you shouldn't charge people with money. First, let me read for you some hadith and then I will give you my conclusion based on this hadith. But please listen to all the discussion. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says it was written in the first book maktubun fil kitab al awwal perhaps he means the very first book sent down by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yabna adam allim majanan kama ullimta majanan o son of adam in the same way that you were taught free of charge, you should teach people also free of charge. Allah, prophets, messengers taught us free of charge. We should also teach free of charge. In another hadith, he said, "Ta'allamu al-Qur'an, wa la ta'kulu bih, wa la tastakbir bih." Learn Quran, but don't eat with the Quran. 
Don't use the Quran as a way of making money. And don't become arrogant due to the Quran because you know you can read Quran, you can teach Quran, you can I don't know give tafsir. This should not make you proud, you should become more humble. So taking money and becoming proud and arrogant are problems. Imam Sadiq salam said, Man arad al hadith le man fa'at al dunya, lam yakun lahu fil akhirat nasibun. Whoever wants to learn hadith for the sake of dunya, wa man arad bihi khayr al akhirah. But if someone seeks with that good of Akhirah, Allah would give him good in dunya and good in Akhirah. He knows what to do. I don't need to teach him or remind him. <laughs> oh Allah, you know, I have family. Oh Allah, I have some, you know, expenses. Dedicate your time, talents, knowledge to learning and teaching and guiding people, helping people. And Allah will sort out your dunya and akhirah. I will inshallah have a concluding remarks inshallah. Imam Sadiq alayhi salam said, Man istakala bi'ilmihi iftakara. We have this concept of istikal in our hadith. This is one sample. We are asked not to do istikal. Istikal comes from akl. Akl means to eat. Istikal means to use your knowledge to eat. People have different jobs. Someone is selling bread, someone is selling meat, someone is selling, I don't know, some services, someone is selling, for example, uh, clothes, shoes. Can I also sell my knowledge? I'm selling Quran, I'm selling Hadith, I'm selling Akhlaq, I'm selling Ahkam. This is my good, uh, this is my product. <laughs> If someone eats by means of his knowledge, he or she will become poor. Poor in dunya, but for sure much worse is that in akhirah is poor also. Someone called Hamzat ibn Hamran. Ask Imam Sadiq about the gifts that we may receive. Sometimes we receive gifts, hadiah. He said to Imam, Ju'il to Fidak, may I be your ransom? Inna fi shi'atika wa mawalik qawman yata'allamuna ulumakum wa yabuthunaha fi shi'atikum among your shia your followers there are people that they learn your knowledge and spread it among your shia fala yu'damuna ala zalika minhum al birra wa al silata wa al ikram and then it's not that they don't receive any gift, any hedia, or any, for example, honor, extra honor, you know, because sometimes also you receive extra honor. And if you do it for the sake of that extra honor, again, that's a problem. So, is this also a problem? They learn, they teach, but they may receive some hediyah, some gifts, some honor. Imam said, 
ليس أولئك المستأكلين. The Imam said, no. These are not the people that we say do istikal. They eat with knowledge. No. These people are people who have interest in our knowledge. They want to learn and teach people. But they also are given some gifts. People feel responsible to show their appreciation. إِنَّمَا الْمُسْتَعْكِلُ بِعِلْمِ The one who eats with his knowledge is something else. إِنَّمَا الْمُسْتَعْكِلُ بِعِلْمِ الَّذِي يُفْتِي بِغَيْرَ إِلْمٍ وَلَا هُدًا مِنَ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ The one that issues a verdict gives fatwa, gives opinion to people without knowledge, without any guidance from Allah. And then he would disregard rights of people. Because he wants to get something from dunya. This person is receiving money from people who have power, from people who have money, from people who have influence, and based on their interest, he interprets Islam. He issues fatwa. Because if you think knowledge is the product that you have, and this is your you know, job, so you give your service to the people who pay you, and if someone can pay you more, you give them priority. And little by little, you change things and manipulate in order to keep them pleased. Because you have lost your dedication to the truth. It has become just a way of making money. And when it becomes a way of making money, Little by little, you may even do haram things. Because you have a position that many people come to benefit from your position. You are not like someone has, you know, ordinary product. Always people who have power, people who have money, or want to get these things, they approach ulama. Because they want to get to power. And if Alam is not afraid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and if Alam is looking for dunya, then becomes a tool for these people. And we have this in the course of history. So, what is the conclusion? My humble opinion is this, based on all the evidence, that first of all, there are things for which we should never ask for money. Our ulama say in fiqh to take money for doing something which is wajib is haram. For example, A mu'min has died, we have to do Salatul Mayyid. This is wajib kifai upon all of us. Can someone say, you know, give me money to do this? No. They cannot charge money because it's wajib. Of course, we have some discussion if, for example, you know, someone's job become like this and there are no other people to take care of this. Like people, for example, who know who work in, for example, cemeteries, you know, they uh, do Muslim Mayyid all the time and this is their job. Here, many times, ulama say this is not be given to them as a salary. But as a support, we can say because you are doing this on behalf of all of us, we give this hediya to you. Or they find other ways, like giving them for transport, etc. But basically, the concept is very important. How you technically solve these issues is another issue. But 
technically the concept is very beautiful that if something is wajib I cannot charge people for it then ta'limul wajib wajib if someone has to say his prayer it's wajib for him then if I know how to say prayer and I have to teach him for me this is also necessary I cannot charge him I can charge him for how to do nawafil but I cannot charge him for how to do wajibat so this is something that in fiqh you have clear guidelines that there are things for which you cannot ask for money there are things that you can ask for money but let us not look at it only from a fiqh perspective don't look at it just is it halal or is not halal it's haram or not haram no look at it from perspective of responsibility perspective of what is your legacy in this life what you want to do if you want to use knowledge as a way of getting close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you want to be continuing the job of the prophets and teachers and imams if you want to be like that hadith which said if someone's death comes while he is learning Islam in order to le- he is learning in order to revive Islam lam nabiyun illa there is only one degree below the prophets if you are working for that don't bring money to your calculations don't bring money to the equation so I have to teach I should not say let me teach here because they give more or the other people who are poor they don't have anything to give I don't teach them the other people can afford I teach them these calculations should not be brought as much as possible see where you can be more useful where knowledge is more needed where people appreciate more people invite you for example I don't know maybe you are also a scholar maybe you are a lecturer people invite you for Muharram for Ramadan always consider where you can be more useful not where you will be paid more so we have a legal issue we have a spiritual issue legal issue is not to take money for teaching wajibat but from a spiritual perspective we should try to teach for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala maybe my niya is not 100% clear but I try to refine it and purify and improve to add to my sincerity and for sure the bottom line is never let money or position affect what you teach and the content never change things to please people you have to follow knowledge and truth which is understood through knowledge of course it's a big problem that if I am employed as a teacher as a scholar as an alim sometimes the people who pay me they may try to decide for me what to say what not to say you know that's a problem but in a good situation we can tell alim that we need these services from you we need for example salat al jamaah we need i don't know, you know lecture we need dua we need counseling okay but we should not say to alim you should say this you should say that 
If he's a qualified alim, if he's not an alim, why you bring him in the first place? Don't bring someone that you don't <laughs> yourself trust him. But if he's an alim, he's qualified, his knowledge is taqwa, he should tell you what? what needs to be said. So, we should, for the sake of not depriving ourselves from the benefits of teaching and learning, as much as possible, try not to think about financial side. As much as possible. I know there are people that this is the only income that they have. And they are not after money, but they need this. But I'm saying as much as possible. As much as possible, put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and try at least to reduce calculations at you know and the language of you know money and charging you know hourly this much or that as much as possible and allah has guaranteed for the seekers of knowledge to support them let alone for the teachers but on the other hand as much as we talk about teachers and scholars not to expect money community and people who benefit from their knowledge should feel responsible to support them if I send my for example a student or my child to a school or tuition center I pay for maths for physics etc I should be more than happy to give to someone who is teaching them Quran, teaching them akhlaq, teaching them maqaid. This is not a waste, it's not a burden, it's a barakah for your money that you can use it to encourage people to carry on with this without difficulty. So in Islam many times we have these beautiful ways of dividing tasks i should do good for you without expecting any even thanks but you must thank the one who gives la nuridu mankum jazaan wa la shukura but the one who receives man lam yashkur al makhluq lam yashkur al khaliq if you are not thankful to the people you are not thankful to allah as scholars, teachers should not expect money, but read the hadith how Ahlul Bayt themselves treated teachers of their children. So, in a good situation, everyone does his own job. In a bad situation, those who should do it for the sake of Allah ask for money, and those who should give money, they don't give money as much as they can. And there is a you know negotiation going on, even sometimes you know complaint, and sometimes they take each other to the court. This is not a good situation. Should be the other way around. The one who offers these services is very hesitant to ask or take even, but people you know force them, no, please you take this. It's our honor you take this. So this is my conclusion about uh, the hadith that we have here. Then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Al-ilmu idha sorry Al-alimu idha arada bi-ilmihi vajhallah If alim is trying to gain to seek face of God. Ibtaqa about Allah have in the Quran. If it's for the sake of pleasure of Allah. Habahu kull shay. Everything will be afraid of him. No one would dare disobeying him. وَإِذَا أَرَادَ أَنْ يَكْنِزَ بِهِ الْكُنُوزِ But if he wants to get money and make, you know, lots of money and, you know, put into treasures, treasure boxes, 
خاف كل شيء. He would be afraid of everything. So either everything would be afraid of you, or you would be afraid of everything. This is the difference. Okay, it seems that uh, unfortunately our time is over. Inshallah, in the next session, I will talk about the things that we should try to achieve in Islamic education. When it comes to certain things that we have to acquire as a knowledge, certain things as attitude, and certain things as practices. All these three, inshallah, issues we have to discuss, bi'iznillah, next week. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send his salutations to Muhammad and all Muhammad, to all the prophets and messengers and imams and all true scholars from beginning to the end of this world and to every seeker of knowledge. And may Allah inshallah include us among this great circle of teachers and scholars of the truth. Amen. لا هي الله صل على محمد